We're back with another episode of the Room for Nuance podcast. I'm Sean with my guest. Lig Duncan. Or as his friends call him, Dr. Duncan. <laughs> Brother, will you ask for the Lord's help as we yeah, get started? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of having a conversation this way that not only involves a couple of friends, but can bring in hundreds of other friends mm -hmm. into that conversation. We pray that it would be glorifying to Christ, that it would help build the church, that it would encourage pastors and church leaders, and that you would give us help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we typically like to start the show just by asking people to share a three to five minute version of their testimony. Mm. Would you mind doing that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I grew up in a wonderful believing home. My mother was a Southern Baptist from East Tennessee okay. who had uh, done, uh, she she did her university work at the, the State Baptist College in Tennessee, Carson mm -hmm. Newman, and uh, then eventually went to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary to do a master's in church music and wow. uh, then doctoral work at Northwestern. And then she had directed choirs in Baptist churches in North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia, and was called to be the uh, a music professor at Furman University. And that's where she and my dad met. They hmm. met on a blind date. Uh, dad came from an, he was an eighth generation Southern Presbyterian ruling elder. So mm. I had a, a Southern Baptist mom and a, and a, and a Presbyterian dad. And actually as a, as a young child, I, I was taken back and forth from first Baptist in Greenville to second Presbyterian in Greenville, but eventually was reared under a really wonderful, faithful, uh, minister at second Pres, a man named Gordon Reed, who had a huge impact on my life. Um, I, 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 my mother was always my theological conversation partner and, uh, she was wonderfully theologically read and articulate. And so when I had theological questions, I typically talked with her. I'd been talking with mom about what faith is, what repentance is, what regeneration is, et cetera, probably from the time I was five or six years old when wow. I was 10. Uh, I, I, what I actually did is I, I, we had a, a communicants class at our church where okay. the pastor would take uh, young people, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, through a gospel. Yeah, he would do a different gospel every year. At the end of that time, if they felt that they were ready to make a public profession of faith, they would be examined by the elders, and then they would make a public profession of faith. And I went through, I think I studied the Gospel of Mark with him one year, and at the end of that time, even though I had a number of friends in the class, I really didn't feel like I was ready to make a public profession, partly because I knew that it would please my mom and dad, and I knew that that was not a good reason mm. to make a public profession. So I didn't. And that, for that, was, that was maybe early fall of one year. That next summer, I always spent a month in Titusville, Florida with my grandparents, my, my mom's mom and dad, and they were faithful Southern Baptist members at First Baptist in Mims, Florida. And that summer, Billy Graham did a, uh, an evangelistic campaign in Orlando, and mm. I listened to him preach mm. all night for like, all, all week for like five nights. In person? Yeah. Not over the they radio? Would take me, they would wow. take me. We, we were not okay. hop, skipping a jump away from yeah. Orlando. Yeah, okay. So that really had an impact on me, just mm -hmm. evangelistic, mm -hmm. direct mm -hmm. preaching. And the pastor of their church was a, a man named Joe Reitmeyer, who was a dear friend of Adrian Rogers. Rogers yeah. And uh, and so I went to Pastor Joe and just asked him to talk with me about the gospel. And he walked me through the gospel. And when I went back home at the end of the summer, I said, I want to do communicants class again with Mr. Reed because I think yeah. that I'm ready to make a public profession. So I did communicate. We went through the gospel of John that yeah. time. And at the end of that time, I thought, I'm, I, I understand this. I understand the gospel wow. and I'm ready to make a public How profession. How old were you? I was 10. 10. So uh, that, you know, and it, again, the, the Lord put my mom, my dad, my pastor, you know, uh, godly grandparents, a faithful pastor in Mims, Florida, all these things in my life helped me yeah. receive the word of God. So, One plants, yeah. another waters. Yeah, that's right. But the Lord yeah. gave the growth. Yeah. Wow. And how did you, A, become reformed and B, lamentably become Presbyterian? <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've told Mark... And aren't they really the same I was, thing? I was digging, I was digging <laughs> through, I was digging through some, a box of memorabilia that has, had probably been unsealed for years. And I discovered 
my baby dedication hey. certificate from First Baptist <laughs> Greenville, South Carolina. And so, I, I, I sent I sent a picture of it to Al and to yeah, Mark, you yeah. know, and they they did the tear emoji back, you know. <laughs> so yeah, so you close. were doomed. You were yeah, so close. So close yeah, know? yeah. It's um, I I I I always would have been inclined to being soteriologically mm-hmm. reformed yeah. be, because of my conservative evangelical Presbyterian upbringing. And because mom, frankly, mom knew more theology than dad did at mm. that point. Dad was a late, he, dad caught on to reading later in life. Okay. And, uh, and, and mom, she was always a reader, always a teacher, always a professor. And she had probably been reared under a moderately Calvinistic pastor mm. in East Tennessee. Okay. He quoted Which would have been Spur- more common for yes, Baptist quoted back Spurgeon then. Yeah. a lot. You can't quote a lot of Spurgeon without yeah. getting the theology of grace mm-hmm. coming mm-hmm. through. And so, so reform soteriology was never an issue for okay. mom. Okay. And so that was, you know, that 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 was sort of the fountain uh, for me. I also I, I memorized the the shorter catechism of the Westminster Confession, which is a beautiful reformed soteriology laid out yeah. in its presentation of yeah. the Ordo Salutis and those sorts of things. But I didn't understand those things experientially. And right. I, my story is I struggled with assurance from 10 to 14, partly because I was a, I was, I was a confused Calvinist. I, I was actually Arminian in my theology of, of assurance. Mm. And I heard a pastor preach on Ephesians 1 at a youth conference, and it dawned on me that before I had ever reached out in faith to God, he had reached out in grace to me. Praise and, God for that youth pastor. Amen. Or, for preaching or, or, through Ephesians yeah. 1, you know? Yeah. And that was, it was like the lights came on. Now, I, if, I had, if I had understood the catechism that I had memorized, I would have already right. known that. But experientially, that wasn't a reality until I heard it from Ephesians mm. 1. And of course, that's how we all, we want to get our stuff from the Bible. Sure. You know, as, as wonderful sure. as our confessions and catechisms yeah. are, I remember Sinclair Ferguson saying it makes all the difference in the world if you believe something because you read it in Burkhoff or because you read something that you believe something you read in Amen. Paul. And, right? and that is a weakness yeah. of our reformed world. And you know? so th- that was huge for me. And so yeah. experientially right then, the, the, the theology of grace, it, it just, it was hugely important to wow. me. And so fr- from that time on, I was very conscious of being reformed. Now in those days... It's not in the happy days like we have today. Uh, you know, I know there are all sorts of hard things today, but let me tell you, there's, here's, here's one way that it's super different. My, you know, Greenville County had 346 Baptist churches and probably 11 Presbyterian churches. Mm. But there was, not, there was not a Southern Baptist Calvinistic congregation mm-hmm. in the county. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and though maybe Calvinism might have been beat up here or there in a passing comment, Southern Baptists in the 1960s and 70s were not paying attention to Calvinism because it just was not, it was not, a, there was not even yeah. a blip on the yeah. radar screen. Yeah. So yeah. my my Baptist friends were by default Arminian. Yeah. They were, they were, they, they loved the Bible. They cared about evangelism. They cared about the church. Uh, they cared about missions. Uh, they were a little worried about me that I might be a liberal because I was a Presbyterian. And that was a pretty good guess in those days because sure, most of the Presbyterians sure. that they knew would have been theologically liberal. But uh, I, you know, I knew from the time 14 on, I knew I'm, I'm, I'm reformed. And so part of what I did is try to make sure that I didn't, that that didn't end up being the main thing that I argued about with my, with my Baptist friends. That was really wise of you at such a Well, I age. wanted, I wanted them to believe the Bible because one thing that was happening was that in, in many of their institutions, the Bible was being undermined. The Baptist colleges, attack, yeah. the Baptist seminaries. Yeah. And so I wanted them to believe the Bible. So that that if we're going to get an argument, let's get an argument about the Bible. Let's get an argument about the Jesus. Let's yeah. get an argument about the gospel. And so that that was my mo. Because when I went off to college, uh, I was at the, what was still then the State Baptist College of South Carolina, Furman University. And the the challenge there was the religion department was trying to talk impressionable young Southern Baptists into rejecting the theology that they had heard preached by their own pastors. Mm-hmm. 
And their own pastors may have been Arminian, and I might have been a Calvinist, but their home pastors did believe in the Bible, they believed in Jesus, and they believed in the gospel. And yeah. so my, I, I was a member of the Baptist Student Union there. Mm. Um, and, and, and my whole thing was don't reject the theology that your pastor is teaching you back home. He believes in the Bible. He believes in the gospel. He believes in the deity of Christ. So I had those kinds of relationships, though I, I knew I was soteriologically reformed. And yeah. again, there, there, wasn't, there, were, there was a small reformed fellow at Furman University, but not very big. Yeah. It mostly was not Southern Baptist because you had the, the Baptist Student Union had most of the engaged uh, Baptist kids there, and and they, they were they, there was no there was no reformed resurgence going on right. in those days. Right. It was in those days it was that I didn't realize it, but that was sort of in the middle of the battle for the Bible mm -hmm. in the in the nineteen seventies. Harold yeah. Lenzel mm -hmm. writes battle for the Bible, and then eventually you get the Council on Biblical Inerrancy. Um, so Calvinism wasn't the thing. It was it was the Bible and then basic yeah. Apostles' Creed yeah. kind of Christian doctrine uh, was was what I ended up talking with my friends about. Incredible. I'm I'm just taking a note because I don't want to forget to ask you about certain things that uh, <laughs> I'm thinking of as you're talking. Okay, so uh, I did something a little different for your interview. I went on our. Uh, room for nuance page. And I said, who here loves Ligon Duncan? And everyone said, we do. And then I said, uh, and then I said, what are some questions that we absolutely cannot forget to ask? So I'm going to start there. And then right. if there's time, cause Luke will kill me if I don't do this, we're going to get to the regulative principle. Okay, super. Uh, thoughts on the last five years in evangelicalism. Mm. You're a historian. Yeah. You see the way things shift and yeah. move over time. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I actually, the, the way I group it timeline is really back to 2012. I think, okay. I think Shy, if you've read Shy yeah. Lin's timeline in, yeah. in his, his book, I really think he captures it well. I think we've been in a disorienting time mm -hmm. in evangelicalism. And some of that has been the political and cultural polarization that yeah. we're living through. And it's just and, getting into the church. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and, and it has. And so in some places, the church has just been co-opted by either mm. left or right yeah. and is a pawn in the, in the hands of forces that don't care anything about Jesus, don't care anything about theology, don't care anything about the gospel, yeah. but they have an agenda. It's a political agenda or a cultural agenda, and the church is simply the handmaiden to that. And that, yeah. has, that has driven some of the polarization. Yeah. Uh, are you hopeful? Oh, I am because, I mean, you, you, you look out at this conference, you've got 11,000 young people that could be doing anything over their yeah. winter break. Yeah. And they're here. And, and I, when I talk to them, the, you know, you think, number one, a missions conference, really? 11,000, 18 to 25 yeah. years old are going to come yeah. to a missions conference? But when I talk to them, they say, and, and they're involved in, in organizations. They're involved in crew and InterVarsity and campus outreach and all these other organizations yeah. out there. And what they say is the content of this conference is more substantial and better wow. than any other place I go. And, and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, and, and you're here because you want substance, you want, yeah, you, yeah. you know, and that just makes me happy. And the, mm -hmm. the thing is, I meet, I meet this all over the world. Because of my job, I'm on every continent about once yeah. every 18 months. Yeah. And um, and it's this is there everywhere I go. Yeah. And so I am very hopeful about that. I, I think I think twenty uh, twenty four is going to bring us another season of uh, discontent. Of, yeah, of discontent. <laughs> another winter of discontent. And, yeah. and and polarization. Don't care. Jesus is going to win. Yeah. God's working a plan out. There are good. I, I, as long as we can get people to really care about the Bible and yeah. really care about theology and really care about the Great Commission. Yeah. The other things will pale in comparison because when when you think about the the things that we have gone through that are a part of this polarization, and then you look back over the two hundred years of this country, there have been other times when far more catastrophic things have been divided. Whatever us. could you mean? You know, <laughs> this is the no. most divided we've uh, ever you know, been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so I, I I think as long as we are discipling a generation in a deep commitment to the sole final authority of Scripture, yeah to robust, historic, biblical Christian theology, to yeah. an absolute commitment to the Great Commission. Yeah. The, everything will work out. It, I don't know how what the timetable of, of that will be, yeah. but the church needs to be discipled 
by the scriptures and by the church, not by the world. And we're yeah. just struggling right now yeah. with people that are that are trying <laughs> to play the hand of being we're the real Christians, but actually importing a worldly outlook and wanting to disciple the church on the left and the right. On the with left that. and the right. And yeah. we just need to we're the Bible guys. We're the theology guys. Amen. We're the Great Commission guys. Yes. And it'll, you know, I don't know when when we'll get through this period, yeah. but we will. And the, the young people that come to RTS, that come to Southern, that come to Midwestern, and I could go down the yeah, list right. of wonderful institutions where the Bible is believed and theology is sound, uh, they, they know they're out of step with their culture. Yeah. They know that. And uh, th- th- so they've already taken a step to, to being marginalized. Mm. And they're okay with that. And, yeah. uh, and, and that... That's to an old guy like me. That's very encouraging because my my contemporaries, we were living in a time where there was at least outwardly evident church growth in mm-hmm. our culture. A lot of that was nominal. A yeah. lot of that was superficial. But because of that, we we bought into worldly aspirations. I'm going to be pastor of a big church. Mm. I want to have a big salary. Mm. I want to drive a big car, live a big house, and that sort of thing. And you know, I, my young people come come to seminary. They they know that that's not their future. Yeah. Their future may be a bivocational pastor. Yeah. Their future may be planning a church in a bombed out. Uh, you know, department store yeah. in a dying small town, you know, yeah. and they're up for that. They just want to be faithful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that can't but encourage me Amen. when I see it. So. I was talking with a mutual friend of ours recently and I, I was asking him about a, a an issue in our cultural moment. And he was like, yeah, I'm in India right now with 500 pastors who have no idea what you're talking about, but they're going out and risking their lives every day for the gospel and even as a historian, you think back, I mean, Arianism, I mean, several centuries of darkness, will the right. deity of Christ prevail right. in the church? So this little cultural flare up in, yeah. in light of history, in light of what's happening all over the world, there's, it's not, it's not a big reason no. to be discouraged. And I, you know, I get it. These kinds of cultural turns that we're living through, and we're living in through a cultural turn. What happens is Christians have historically gone different directions in how to navigate those cultural terms. Yeah. And I, I can show it to you at, at kind of every age and stage in, in every sort of geographical area of the globe. And you look at China. I mean, one, one reason you have the three self churches and you have house churches is Christians turn, took a different turn in how That's do you right. deal with communism. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm I'm not commending one as 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 equally good as the other, but I'm right. just saying Christians, when when they're faced with these kinds of totalizing influences and demands from mm-hmm. the culture, mm-hmm. they will tend to go a couple of different directions in how they try to navigate that, and we're seeing that right now. And yeah. the you know the big thing in our culture it's gender, marriage, and sexuality. Yeah. That's that drives so many things in our culture right now, whether you're going to be accepted, whether you can be employed, Mm -hmm. you know, things of that nature. Wow. Uh, Speaking of uh, gender and family and stuff related to that, should we abandon the term complementarianism and start using the term patriarchy? Yeah, I I, I think complementarianism is a better term than patriarchy for the very reason that the term was chosen in the first place. I I I get that the term is a recent term. And I think I think John Piper and Wayne Grudem and Mary Cassian sat down one night at a at a at a hotel Mm -hmm. in uh, in outside of Wheaton, Illinois, and came up with, hey, that's going to be the term that we go with. So I but what what they were trying to say is there, there were already people that were into patriarchy in the bad way that yeah. we see it out there today. Mm-hmm. There were already people like that around. And they, so they want to say, no, no, we're, we don't want to use patriarchy like that because we're not trying to baptize misogyny mm-hmm. and, uh, a, you know, an abusive authoritarianism and all this kind of stuff. We're, we're, we're trying to express what the Bible says about the way that men and women are to relate to one another in marriage and in the church, yeah, and um, and so I, I still think the term is a is a good term, uh, but, but the key is, of course, that we are teaching the truth from Scripture, Amen. and it is going to be uncomfortable to teach that truth from Scripture, no call matter this, what terminology yeah. Yeah. you use in this culture. It's sort of pick your poison, yeah, uh, because people. 
You know, it does not matter how far you bend over to be helpful and bring people along. It's like no good deed goes unpunished yeah. in, in this area. Yeah. And I, I, you've probably seen the thing. Uh, Kathy Keller tells the story in, in, her, in, in one of her little books uh, that they, they had discipled this young woman along at, uh, at Redeemer Church in New York. And complementarianism is one of the things that they teach as part of the core teaching of the, of the church. And this woman gets ready to join and she says, now wait, um, do we have women as pastors and elders here? And Kathy said, well, no. I mean, we are convictionally, we believe in, in qualified men to serve as pastors and elders. And the woman looks at her right in the eyes and said, I feel like you just told me that my father was a child molester. Wow. <laughs> you know, so it, it, you know, all of that careful, slow, yeah, sweet right. discipleship, bringing somebody along and, and you're looked at like you are a monster. Mm. And so it doesn't matter what you call it. If, if, if you believe what the Bible says, there are going to be some people in this culture utterly offended by that. And I, my personal view about that is that means that you should never put it on the back burner. You need to be upfront with yeah. people. Let me tell you the three things you're going to hate Get about Get fired me. in the interview. You know, yeah, yeah. We do that in our yeah. church membership classes. Yeah. Here are the five distinctives. We're complementarian. We're cessationist. Right. We're, you know... Yeah, because we, what we don't want is for you to join the church and a year later be like, what? What? Yeah. yeah. Okay, since you brought up Kathy Keller, uh, <laughs> our, our brother, uh, Tim Keller, has gone to be with yeah. the Lord. Um, man, what a loss. Uh, pr praise God for all the fruit that his ministry has borne. You don't have to agree with him about no. everything no. to appreciate his ministry. Colin Hansen's biography was superb, very useful in understanding uh, why Tim did a lot of what he did the yep. way he did it. But uh, you are one of the people who's had, I think, two debates with him on the floor of the General Assembly. Uh, I've only I've only listened to one and it was several years ago, but can you speak at all to Tim's life and legacy, especially as someone who has had to, you know, go, kind of not really go to the ground with yeah. him, but debate him about things that, that you disagreed on? Right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a late comer to Tim, though the we had occupied the same, you know, tiny, you know, our little corner of the Shire, yeah, uh, right. you know, the PCA is we're tiny compared to, to the Southern so, Baptist yeah. world or the larger evangelical world. Uh, we had occupied the same territory, but Tim, Tim's about 10 years older than me. And uh, it was that first debate on women deacons and deaconesses mm -hmm. that brought us together. And I, I've always in life, I would rather have a debate over things that I deeply care about and disagree upon with a friend mm -hmm. rather than someone that I don't like. Yeah. And so it was a real blessing to be able to have that conversation with Tim. And um, but he kind of didn't debate you, right? He <laughs> he showed up and then he was like, that's, eh. "That's that's Tim's way, right? Yeah. That's Tim's way." I mean, Tim doesn't like to be polemical. Mm -hmm. you know, that was just mm -hmm. never he did. Tim, his his posture was always apologetic and evangelistic. It he was. was always trying to make a case for the gospel. Mm -hmm. He was trying to strip away objections to the gospel and mm -hmm. to Christianity, and he was trying to reach out and persuade. And he was an evangelist at his he heart. Really was yeah. And so he 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 was really uncomfortable in polemical settings. Yeah. Now he had strong opinions and well-founded opinions, mm -hmm. and I I actually enjoyed arguing with him in private mm -hmm. more than in public, mm -hmm. because he didn't. You know, when you're in public and you're a person of his stature. Every, everybody is listening for every nuance of what you say, and they'll have a read on whatever you say, however you say it. Yeah. When you're in private, you don't have to be careful that way. And so, you know, I've, I've been in a room with Al Mohler, Mark Dever, Tim Keller, and me, and unbelievably candid interactions. Yeah, right. And that was super enjoyable. Yeah. From a debate standpoint, more enjoyable than being in a public setting. But what was... You know, just like the first time I met Vern Poitras at Westminster Seminary, unbelievably smart guy. But you meet Vern and you immediately love him. He mm. just, he loves Jesus. He mm. loves the Bible and you just love the man. Well, I, same thing with Tim. You just, you meet Tim 
and you just you you talk to him for a little bit, and you just I love this man. Yeah. I, you know, I love I love the way he loves Christ. You know, when when you learn his story, and and I do think Colin really helped a lot of people come mm-hmm. into oh oh that's mm-hmm. that's where that comes from mm-hmm. in Tim. That's where mm-hmm. that comes from in Tim. That's where that comes from in Tim. And I I knew a little of that because my wife went to Gordon Conwell okay. a little bit after yeah. Tim, but she had the same theological experience at Gordon Conwell that Tim and Kathy did. And so I got I, I used to tell people if you want to understand Tim, you have to understand Gordon Conwell, nineteen seventy five. Mm-hmm. It's just Everything, whether it's loveless on dynamics of the spiritual life or whether, you know, I go down the list of the people and, and of course, especially Meredith Klein yeah. that had a huge impact on Tim. But I, you know, so it was really good to be put in that setting because I think people thought that we were going to come out, you know, with, you know, yeah. with, with guns blazing and, and a fisticuffs and all of that. And we had a really good, enjoyable engagement that I think was clarifying and it ended up being unifying for the denomination. And and then we had several other public engagements like that. But I tell you, one of the great blessings has been the last seven years, I've taught Introduction to Pastoral and Theological Studies in New York City with Tim. So next oh. week, I will teach it without Tim for the first time in oh, seven years. Wow. So it's a really poignant thing for me. And I'm actually, what this will surprise some people on this call. Whereas Tim started when we were teaching that course, doing a lot of his cultural engagement stuff up front. He realized after the first group of students that most of our students were basically unfamiliar with reform soteriology. So what Tim, he put all these cultural engagement stuff aside and his one agenda in his lecture hours was to convince them of reform soteriology. Wow. And um, and it and he, he also did a lot of stuff on call to the ministry that was helpful too, but um, I, I, there are a lot of people out there that I think that would surprise that would surprise oh, them. You know, that he set aside Tim contextualization, City, yeah, sets aside contextualization to go after Calvinism to make sure you understand and, grace. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so that was fun to be able to see him do that yeah. and to watch how he did that and how he handled objections. And uh, I, that was one of the great privileges because I would sit in on his classes mm-hmm. and um, he, he was a master teacher. He remembered everything that he had mm-hmm. ever read. I've had a few professors like that in my life. Tim's got that same thing. Yeah. I had a professor in Edinburgh who remembered things that he had read 50 years ago. He could tell you exactly where they were on the page. <laughs> yeah. He would get a paragraph quote yeah. almost exactly right. That's how Tim is. And so though Tim had never done a PhD, he had that kind of mojo yeah. uh, for Him an academic, for you know, just yeah. because of yeah, uh, because of his memory and because of his intelligence, and uh, and he was interested in everything. He was always saying, "Hey, have you read? Have you read? Have uh-huh. you read?" And he uh-huh. he was reading so widely. He was reading stuff that I hadn't read. Yeah. And so he'd say, "Oh, you need to read this. You need to read yeah. this." And so that was fun. And we we interacted a lot, text, email, phone calls. Um, over the last four or five years of his life, and yeah. and that was a, a special privilege. And he, you know, he he had admonitions for me along the way. Like when he when he knew things were going downhill with the cancer, he he said to me over a year ago. He said, uh, "Look, how old are you?" And I I think at the time I was sixty one or sixty two. And he said, "Don't think that you have time." Oh wow! And that was a really good. And I'm not a person who takes for granted the time that the Lord has given me, but that was a really good admonition to have from Tim. So I I got to be a little bit of a part of his life in that way. That was, uh, that was a, a wonderful friendship. And, and, and though I'm, you know, in the PCA, people would uh, associate me with the more confessional wing of the, of the PCA, Tim and I had the most delightful working relationship and were totally on the same page with what we were trying to do with our students in New York city. Wow. Praise God. Switching gears a little, uh, classical theism. That's the argument we're having these days. Where do you land on that? Yeah, I'm thankful for that. Uh, I, you know, I, in, in the 1970s and eighties, uh, because the, the big thing was just the battle for the Bible. So the doctrine of special revelation was a front burner issue it was not uncommon for evangelicals to question all kinds of historic commitments to the 
Christian doctrine of God that Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants would have all agreed upon up sure. until the 19th century. Sure. But the 20th century, you had people jettisoning the doctrine of divine simplicity, divine impassibility, uh, immutability. I can go down the list of things that, that relatively solid evangelicals had thrown out the window. Sure. And so the, the recovery of a robust, historic, and biblical Christian doctrine of God, call it classical theism or well, yeah, whatever right, else, yeah. is a is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. And um, and and I, you know, I, I've told Scott, my my pro, uh, president at RTS Orlando has been a big part of that. His he's a Trinitarian theologian, has written in that uh, Zondervan series of Scott short intro, Scott Swain uh, short introduction yeah. on the Trinity. Yeah. I told Scott, you know, Scott, you. You have made me go back and think about how I've said things in my mm. Doctrine of God course. Yeah. You know, things that I've said for 30 years that I've wanted to try because of the insights that you have given to me, I've wanted to tighten up yeah. what, what I was doing. I always had, because I was confessional, I was protected against some of the sure. newfangled trends that were out there. Like yeah. I never, you know, the, the uh, people that were jettisoning impassibility, I never bought that because okay. I, I, I knew I couldn't buy that. That's not confessional, it's not a, a, a historic. Christian approach to God, but the work of these younger guys, and they're everywhere. They're in the Baptist world, they're in the Presbyterian world, yeah, they're in the Anglican right. world, conservative Bible-believing guys, recovering historic Christian doctrine, especially in the doctrine of God. Uh, they've really helped me yeah. uh, and, and I think set us on a good course. The reformers were pretty harsh on scholasticism. Um, some of the guys in this classical theism conversation are more friendly yeah. towards scholasticism. Yeah. Do you think that's just because of how kind of uh, scarred, wounded <laughs> the reformers were because of the the way scholasticism had run amok that's in the Roman good. Catholic Church? Uh, it, you know, you, you will you will find a mixed report in the reformers on the scholastics, and it depends on which scholastic you're talking about. True. So, you know, Luther for sure was completely fried with late medieval nominalism. And look, I would have been too. I'd, I'd right. have been over in the corner cheering, go, Luther, go. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the late medieval nominalists come in for a lot of pounding from both the Lutheran and the Reformed. That's still going on today. But there, there are also scholastic theologians uh, who the, the 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 reformers the first generation reformers quoted with approbation, and um, and and so you know, Calvin was not trained in a classical theological curriculum. He was a humanist trained. I mean, his his, his dissertation was on Seneca's. Uh, thesis on clemency. Mm -hmm. uh, he, had, he had been prepared for law and then went in a different direction. Mm -hmm. he, he, he does not in the way that a uh, Petrus van Maastricht or a, or a uh, Francis Turretin or someone like that cite the scholastics and such, but you you can find an you can find Calvin citing scholastic opinion in an approving way, and then slapping around the schoolmen in yeah. other areas. Yeah. And you can find a little bit of that in just about all okay. of the reformers. So it, it was it was not a not necessarily a wholesale rejection of everything. I remember R. C. Sproul. I, I, I was doing this conference on the Westminster. Confession before PCA General Assemblies back in the 1990s, early 2000s, and I invited RC to give a lecture on the Westminster Doctrine of God. And he he got up and he, his first sentence was something like this: "There is nothing unique about the doctrine of God in." magisterial Reformed Protestantism in the 16th century in relation to Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Mm. But the most unique thing about magisterial Protestantism in the 16th century was its doctrine of God. And that was such an okay. RC way to start a okay. lecture. Yeah. And then he, he went on to argue that what, what the Reformers had done is that they had worked out the doctrine of God in relation to all the other loci of theology. Okay. So that the sovereignty of God permeated the totality 
of your theology, not just this little area of the doctrine of God and the mm. Trinity. And of course, that, that especially applies to soteriology. You wow. know? And um, But it also applied to things like ecclesiology. And so uh, in, in an interesting way, R.C. kind of anticipated what has happened in the last five, 10 years yeah. amongst all these young guys. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I did not know that I learned from Colin Hansen's biography of Keller was the connection of Keller and RC. Yes. At, uh, what was the name of the place where they were? Uh, the Ligonier. The Ligonier. Uh, study the Center. original Ligonier yeah, Study yeah, Center. Yeah. Yeah. Before yeah. it was in Florida. Yeah. yeah. Uh, brother, this is not meant to be like a, a clickbaity kind of ooh for the views question, but so so just so let you know what's coming. I, I genuinely want to know because I. When I think, what do I want the young men in my church to be like? How, what are we discipling them towards? And I'm not flattering you. That's a sin. I think Love Ligon Duncan doesn't move an inch on the gospel, hmm. right? Doesn't move an inch on cultural things. Now, I know some people have disagreed with certain decisions sure. and statements you've made. That's true of all of us. Sure. But also incredibly gracious, incredibly Catholic. Even in this interview, the way you've spoken about brothers and sisters with whom you have uh, minor to significant disagreements with, I'm like, that's what I want for our guys uh, and our gals. Uh, yeah. well, thoughts on the Moscow mood conversation? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think, really loaded I think that Kevin, up. Didn't I? I think yeah. Kevin did a, a, a service to us writing on that. I think Kevin realized that he was going to take a lot of incoming uh, on that. He he told me probably a month or two before he was ready to to release that that he was. Well, he doing brought it, it up at and, ETS. Remember, and, he was like, <laughs> uh, and gave me sort of an early uh, draft uh, of it. I think that's a good warning to send right now. I think there there are some people in our culture uh, today who are saying that here, the, this is the model of faithfulness, lob grenades. And, um, and, and I, think, I, I think it's really good for guys like Kevin who himself, Kevin's got backbone. Right, Kevin right. is willing right. to speak into things that he knows are going to get people yeah. upset. He's about. down for the fight. He's, he's down for it. Uh, but th that doesn't mean that you are the most faithful when you are lobbing the most grenades indiscriminately in every direction. That's right. yeah. And when you are doing clickbaity stuff on, you know, it's, it's yeah. one thing to, to LARP faithfulness and courage on social media. It's another thing to do it in real life. And, um, and, I, and I, you've got a lot of live action role playing going on in the social media world from guys acting like they're tough mm -hmm. that, Put them in a room, and you'd have them in a fetal position in yeah. three seconds. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and that's it's not good for that voice to influence our our young folks. We are going to have to cultivate backbone, but we're also going to have to cultivate uh, a love for the world that hates us. I, Bill Davis, who teaches at uh, at uh, Covenant College, says that the most common student question that he gets from his philosophy students is, "Doctor Davis, teach me how to love a world that hates me." And that, mm. you know, so I, I want them, I don't want them to get any of their signals from the world. I want them to get all their signals from the Bible. I want them to faith, be faithful to the whole panoply of Christian doctrine. But I want them thinking, how can I reach out to this lost world? How can I love people that hate me? Not how can I make them hate me more? Uh, how can I demoralize and demean them with every word that I say? How can I drive them away from the gospel for the sake of branding and building my own And tribe? even wound my brothers and sisters Correct. along the way. Correct. Yeah. And so I think that's, I, I really appreciate Kevin being willing to wade into that. And I think it, underneath that is it's, it's not only a mood there, there's a, there's a theological view of the, of the church, of the gospel, of fidelity, and there are problems at each of those levels underneath that. I'm about to ask you about Big Eva, but because you are one of the patriarchs of it, I don't expect an honest answer from you, but let's just, let's just play this game, okay? <laughs> Setting a low bar for me there. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean... What do you think when people talk about this shadowy syndicate, this yeah. big machine of Big Eva? Um, he, he, uh, most of the conversation that I hear about Big Eva is complete nonsense. 
Um, and it, it is funny. Some of the some of the biggest critics of Big Eva, if there is a Big Eva, they're it. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I could name organizations far larger and more extensive than the Gospel Coalition, for instance. Yeah, but boy, do they hate the Gospel Coalition. That hate the Gospel Coalition. Yeah. And, and they've got more money. Mm-hmm. They've got more reach. They've got more, you know, all, and, 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 and they'll jump in on the Big Eva conversation. So a lot of it is just nonsense, and I pay no attention to it whatsoever. Now, um, you know, have have there have, have have people been disappointed by leaders unwilling to take stands on important things? Sure, I'm sure that's happened. Yeah. You know, welcome to the fallen world. Amen. Uh, and uh, I, I want us to be people of principle, and sometimes that means calling out people that we love and care about. But you can you can do that in such a way that is not. We have a culture in in a in a part of evangelical right uh, evangelicalism right now that is desensitized to its own spirit of mocking and slander. Mm-hmm. And that's that kind of goes back to the Moscow mood thing does, again. Yeah. Mocking and slander is not a Christian way of mm-hmm. dealing with anything. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, uh, many of those mockers and, and slanderers, I have no reason to even think they're Christians. Can I pause you yeah. right there? Because well, uh, I know somebody from that world will hear you say that and go, this guy doesn't know his Bible. What about yeah. the prophets? What about Jesus? Yeah. Look at the way Paul talks. Yeah. How would you respond to that? Well, I mean, what one thing is, Jesus was neither a mocker nor a slanderer. Ooh, okay. So uh, when, 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 and and if you, by the way, if 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 some of these folks had been around, they would have been going, "Yay, John the Baptist! Jesus, you're a weasel." Mm, whoa. John is preaching truth to power. Why don't you come out and say, why don't you go up to and say, Herod, you fox? Mm. You know, why don't, you, why don't you be like John? And I think one of the things the Bible teaches you is there are different ways to be faithful. You know, if, if, if some of these people had been around, they would have been on Daniel like white on rice. You're mm. a sellout. Mm. You, you work for the wickedest king in the world. Mm. You are facilitating his wickedness and his ungodly rule. Yeah, Daniel is a high-ranking official in a pagan empire with extensive influence in how the, the empire works. So it, it, in the Bible, you find believers in very different circumstances dealing differently. Now, it, you know, is, is Daniel willing to go to the lion's den rather than stop praying to his God? Yeah, but he's still working for the government. You know, and there's some people that call you out today yeah. for, for that. So I, I, I think that it, let, let's actually look at the Bible and how the Bible teaches Christians to deal with culture. I, 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 I invented a course for RTS called Christ, Culture, and Contextualization. It's a systematic theology course because I saw so many students going out and thinking about contextualization for the first time in their lives, not in the context of theological education, but on, on the field yeah. and doing a really bad job of thinking about contextualization. Some of them giving away the store in compromise. Some of them come up with bad ideas. So I I wanted students to think about contextualization under the watchful eye of a systematic theologian and read the best stuff on that. Because Max Stiles years ago convinced me that a lot of what has happened on the mission field in evangelicalism is driven by a bad ecclesiology of the local church and bad bad contextualization. Mm. And... uh, so I, I had to teach that course for the first time this year. I, I, I forced it on my entire curriculum. And uh, so one of the things I, I did is I, I said, I wonder what key passages I ought to go to uh, to, to look at these things. And, you know, the, 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 you know obviously Genesis 1 and 2 is a place that you're going to go. Um, obviously Matthew 5 and the Sermon on the Mount is a place, salt and light, that, that you're going to go. But what I was struck by is how much instruction there is, not just in the Minor Prophets, not just in Genesis, uh, not just in Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, but all throughout the New Testament, exactly telling Christians how to go about engaging with the culture around them. Like the, the Titus 2 and 3, it's got all kinds of stuff about how you're supposed to engage with your culture, what attitude you're supposed to have towards the lost people around you and, and brothers and sisters and neighbors and even all of that. Even false teachers, correct and your even opponents false, with gentleness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I just started working through those, those passages with, with students. And 
that's what we need to disciple. We need to disciple people with the biblical way of engagement, and it's not always the same way. You need sometimes you need a good cop, and sometimes you need a bad cop. Yeah. And in some cases, John the Baptist was the bad bad cop, and Jesus was not the bad cop. Mm-hmm. Now, there's certainly things that Jesus said that were very in your face and very uh, direct, and they were often directed towards religious leaders who ought to have known better. Yeah. Uh, but when, when you decide to do that, you have to be very confident of your spiritual maturity. Yeah. And I see a lot of incredibly spiritually immature people, like people that I would not allow to disciple my cat <laughs> trying to do that. Okay. <laughs> and, and so, you know, people, I want to go I like, do you know yourself at all? I mean, yeah. do you have any self-awareness yeah. whatsoever? Do you know what you're like? You know, would yeah. anybody in the world go to you, you know, yeah. and, and want to understand the gospel and Christianity yeah. and, but you're going to be the arbiter of who's faithful and who's yeah. not faithful. And so social media has encouraged yeah. us in that direction because anybody with a cell phone can opine to the entire known universe. And, uh, and, and so when, you know, I, I really, by the way, I think that Neil Postman's book, Amusing, Amusing Ourselves, Ourselves to, to Death, death fantastic. explains all of this. Yeah. Now, the illustrations are out of date. Dated, You'll yeah. laugh at them, yeah. et cetera. But he explains this whole dynamic 40 years ago. And um, it, I, w- when your vision for faithfulness in, in engagement is a food fight, you know, whether it's on television or whether it's on Twitter yeah. uh, or X, um, then you're going to have a very different view of what it means to be faithful in relation to your culture. And a lot of it is just feeding ego and a lot of it's envy. And, uh, and again, a lot of it is, is driven by a desire to be important. Yeah. You know, very unimportant people who want to be important. Mm. Brother, you have a heart out at 740. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you this. You, you will not hurt my feelings. I wanted to get your thoughts on Theonomy. I doubt you can answer that in one minute. Do you have another minute to answer that or should we just Absolutely. cut it right no, let's, let's go. Okay. Let's go. I'm, I'm, I'm yours. I'm you here. will not hurt my feelings no, if you say, I'm I here. just got to go. I, you know, I wrote on Theonomy uh, as a young professor at RTS in the early 1990s. You know, Greg Bonson wrote... Theonomy and Christian Ethics while he was a professor at RTS Jackson in the mid 1970s. I did not know that. So theonomy was a ground zero kind of issue when I came to RTS Jackson. And so I, I had to develop a lecture for it in my ethics course. And that eventually became a book which I finished in 1995 or 1996. But by that time, theonomy was already in retreat in reform circles. And so I put it on the shelf and I thought, this will never be relevant again Mm. for the rest of my life. And then behold, you know, from for the, for the last seven years or so, yeah. you know, I see the zombie coming out of the of the grave With force. And uh, so I, I've I actually Jonathan Lehman reached out and asked if we could republish some of that material in the nine marks for the journal magazine yeah. on on reconstructionism. I said, absolutely. And I've, I've realized I need to address that again. So I, I, I would say that um, theonomy and the, the larger reconstruction movement mm-hmm. around it was a well-meaning but misguided cultural overreaction to uh, some some theological things in American culture and to some and to some cultural and political things in American culture. I think that if if you look at the time when theonomy is developing, Rush Dooney, North, Bonson, the you know the original folks that sort of spread the word, mm-hmm. uh, the d- dominant theology of evangelicalism in those days was dispensational antinomianism. Yeah. And so it, it, it's, it's almost like, okay, we're going to do the opposite. And, the, and, <laughs> and a lot of neutral public square talk. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and then at, at the same time, there was a, there was a, there was a gradual rise of the, of the sort of conservative movement in America mm-hmm. through, you know, from before Reagan through yeah. Reagan, the moral and, majority, and, you know, yeah. and then the moral majority. Yeah. And, a, and a lot of these folks ended up being advisors to some, you know, fairly significant public figures and, and politicians. Yeah. And, I think there was a uh, there there was a a, a very optimistic post millennial 
expectation that we're going to not only take back this country, we're actually going to establish, you know, a, a, the, you know, a theonomic yeah. uh, We're really doing uh, it. State. Yeah. You know, we're going to do it. The and, Puritans uh, will be proud. There you go. And, and so that, I think that was the background. I think what's happening now uh, it, it, that we've never been further away from that possibility in our culture than yeah. we are now. And um, just like the abortion abolition movement, you know, Roe v. Wade gets struck down and suddenly there's an abortion abolition movement. Mm. And you go, oh, no, like, where were you like for the last 50 years yeah. while all these evangelical pro-life people were out here, you know, scraping and clawing and trying to do what they could do yeah. to, uh, to, to roll back Roe v. Wade. Same thing with with Reconstructionism. You you, you know, just like you were saying, friends from other countries look at this like it. Like talk to your Chinese friends. Yeah. How impractical is this? Yeah, it's utterly impractical uh, in 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 most parts of the world to even think in these ways. And so you, again, you can be really brave, and you can have these really strong opinions, and you can you can think you're really pure, and you're 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 the you're the one true believer in everyone's midst. And and it's it's there's no possibility of this being implemented uh, in any possible world. Yeah. And um, so th that's one thing that's going on. Th theologically, theonomic re reconstructionism is not a reformed view. That's just you will just not they will they will go back and try and cite magisterial reformers and they mm. will cite them incorrectly. Mm. It is true that there was a shift in the 16th and 17th century. Reformation in its views of church-state relations mm -hmm. and its views of how the Ten Commandments were to be uh, applied in society. And it is true that there was a shift from Britain to America in the Reformed mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. uh, so Baptists and Presbyterians were being thrown in jail in the American colonies yeah. by Anglicans and by Congregationalists. Yeah, they're being whipped. And, and Baptists yeah. and Presbyterians thought, you know, it's really not a good idea for Massachusetts Bay Colony to be a Congregationalist establishment thing where we get thrown into prison, or Virginia to be an Anglican mm -hmm. colony where mm -hmm. we get thrown into prison. We actually believe in freedom of the exercise of religion. Yeah. And uh, and that's a good thing, not a bad thing. It's not infidelity and pluralism. It's a good thing yeah. for the gospel because you don't want people having their consciences forced yeah. in the most important area of all of life. And you've got all of the history of the religious wars behind that. And so there's a real sense in which Protestants invented religious freedom, and in America, Baptists and Presbyterians really forged the consensus that came about on religious freedom. And now you've got a group, you know, sort of wanting to call that into question. Let's go back to monarchy. Let's go back to, uh, you know, to, to state-sponsored persecution, et cetera, et cetera. That's the way to be really faithful. And it's it's very childish yeah. um, to me. It also feels. It feels like a, a visceral response. America, this thing that we've loved for so long that we've felt in control of, we're losing that. Yeah. We're terrified. And listen, I yeah. get it. I don't want drag yeah. queen story hour any yeah. more than you do. And, but as good Bible guys, we're the reform guys. We can't just say, let's take America back. That feels carnal. It's almost like theonomy allows us to baptize that instinct. Yeah. Well, now I'm trying to find theological rationale for this right. impulse, you know? So I can actually say, no, me fighting to save the country is a biblical yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Brother, we could talk so much more. You have to go. <laughs> I'm so thankful, honored, uh, humbled that you would take the time to do this. Uh, let me pray and ask the Lord to bless right. it. Lord, thank you for our brother Lig. Thank you for the example he is to us. We pray that uh, many, especially young men in the church will follow his example, a robust gospel backbone, uh, but full of all the fruit of the spirit, uh, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Self Lord, we pray that, uh, yeah, that, that his ministry would continue to flourish, that RTS would continue to train robust, uh, zealous, joyful ministers for the gospel. Uh, we pray that uh, that his time here at Cross will mm. be fruitful, that every interaction mm. that he has will bear some fruit in eternity. We pray mm. that you'll bless this episode, Lord. Mm. You delight to use the foolish things of the world to shame the wise and and uh, to use small things to, to, to create big fruit. So we pray mm. that you will do that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
let me record my immovable conviction that this is the noblest service in which any human being can spend or be spent. And that, if God gave me back my life to be lived over again, I would, without one quiver of hesitation, lay it on the altar to Christ, that he might use it as before in similar ministries of love, especially amongst those who have never yet heard the name of Jesus. What I'm doing right now is appointed in the Bible to have its unique place. It's one thing. It's called preaching. Do we have a God who wants to be understood, who is God enough to communicate in a way so that humans can know Him, love Him, worship Him, and be saved by Him? Can it really be true that a faithful believer can experience all of these things? And the answer to that question from the Scripture very clearly is yes. Why do we come to church? Why do we hear the Word? Why do we read the Scriptures? We are looking for God. Are the words of Scripture actually what they're meant to be. We're now at a point in time where people question whether Scripture is clear. What we are most accountable for is our handling of the Word of God. We are called to faithfully preach the Word. At Ten of Those, we want to serve the local church by equipping your church family with great resources that are gonna point them to Jesus. So we'll come and set up a pop-up bookstore in your church, there's no charge. We'll come for your Sunday services. Maybe you've got a, a weekend retreat or a conference. We would love to come and then make recommendations. This is one I've read three times now. It's called Incomparable by Andrew Wilson. And he goes through 60 characteristics of God. It just wonderfully takes our eyes off, off the world, off ourselves, and puts them on our Saviour. Now we've got lots of things for families and, uh, and kids. For parents, I want to recommend this series. This one is Raising Kids in a Screen-Saturated World. Our passion is to get good books that hold the Bible read by as many people as possible. We handpick our bookstore, it's curated, so we know everything we sell will point to the Lord Jesus. Everything's discounted. And as we make recommendations, we're seeking to serve your church family so that they may be excited and equipped to read good books. And as they do, we'll be praying that it might just change their life.